like to welcome Mike Gibson. How are you? Terrific. Uh, you were one of the founding members of the Monarchs, isn't that correct? Then you must know that I was flunking chemistry at St. X. You've talked to Dusty Miller. Yeah, we were. Uh, this band came about because of the fact that I was flunking chemistry and you needed a point to get to graduation. And it's no surprise to you or anybody, I would think, that the Glee Club, as we called it then, was full of musicians. So that's where we started. And give me a little bit of history of the Monarchs. This was 1961? When... Actually, 1960. We were still in school, and um, it was my idea that I thought that we should form a band. Uh, didn't have any problems talking to Dusty about it or Don because they, Don was already a guitar player at the time. And so for us to get together, first of all, to enjoy playing and me trying to learn how to play drums after I bought a set um, was how it began. And then it made sense to record a record, which again, we were, I think, graduated by that time. Um, put our 60 bucks together or whatever and went and recorded the tune and were blessed because of Dusty and I pushing it in this community to the degree that it got some airplay and those were the days you could get airplay. So all of a sudden we were a band with a lousy drummer and you're talking to the lousy drummer. Eventually I got talked into getting off of, this, off of the drums and standing up and singing it. That must have been a little bit better at that than I was drums. And that's basically the point where the Blue Angels became the Monarchs when you moved from the drums to out front to exclusively be a singer. The other members joined in. You had four singers and five band members. Yeah, we went from a small group to a large group overnight. Um, we've actually got some photos of that era, and that was taken at St. Stephen Martyr's Teen Club stage. I think they called it Martine, as we all had, what, in town, 15 or 20 Catholic Church teens. But that's when we changed their name to the Monarchs. I always tell everybody that we were called the Blue Angels because we could find some blue coats that matched. And then when we got the gold coats, it made sense to call ourselves the Monarchs. Truthfully, my mom came up with the idea of the calling the Monarchs. After the success of uh, This Old Heart and Look Homeward Angel, um, I think it was Leon Middleton that's credited with referring to you as the voice of the monarchs, and that's kind of stuck through the years. Well, I compliment him and thank him for that. I was really surprised he did it on stage, um, actually at Iroquois and their facility. And I'm pleased to be identified as that sometimes a little uncomfortable with it because there were nine of us. Jerry that, Abramson came up with a saying? Well, Jerry Abramson became, he was invited to sing with us and he only did What's Your Name, but it was a perfect song for him to do. He knew it and he had good, good memories of the, the uh, lyrics and he was the one that referred to us as the musical ambassadors. And then it showed up in print a number of times, and we were quite proud of that. Louisville's music ambassadors, yes, right? Yes, yes, That was quite a compliment at that time. Well, when did you retire from the group, and why? Well, actually, the band... The, I hope this isn't boring, but we actually had to create a a financially structured group to file taxes because we were making money eventually after the records and uh, we formed a partnership and the way the partnership worked is if you were not performing any longer in the band then your ownership and 
but your percentage of ownership of the group was passed on to the other members when you left. Now, I'm not walking around the barn to answer a question. But I thought 20 years was about the time the band would probably want to quit like I did. I was a bass fisherman, which I've said in another piece very similar to this 100 years ago. And I wasn't spending enough time with the family combined with work. And so I thought it would be a great thing for me to cut that part of my life out knowing it was not going to be any fun doing it, but that's why I retired, but nobody else did. I was the only one that did, but it turned out fine. So you did a fair amount of recording in addition to recording with the Monarchs. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I hadn't thought about that. Um, I actually did demos in the Alan Martin studio, even with my sister for Remember the Keys, mm -hmm. Tommy Owens. Uh, he wrote a couple songs that he called upon she and I to record. They were a lot of fun. Actually, they're on uh, YouTube, and occasionally I'll stumble across one, and I can remember thinking how great they were when we did them, but they're so dated. <laughs> But I remember we appeared with uh, the New Beats in a performance where there were multiple bands and we were, I think, the opening act and then the backup act for some others. But we met the New Beats because they had just had their hit, um, Bread, and like Bread and Butter, go sky high on the charts. And, uh, well, it even, pawned, it, it even spawned them doing a copy of This Whole Heart on their second album, or maybe it was their first album, but we became pretty good friends. Um, Henley, the lead singer with the falsetto, retired, quit, separated from the group. And um, I think it was Dean and Mark were the brothers that sang with them that called me up to ask if I would do a song that they had discovered that they thought was a pretty good parallel combo to bread and butter and they needed a follow-up and it was called Sweet Thing. So we went out to the studio and gathered the studio musicians that Hardy and Ray frequently used, Wayne Young, John Campbell, you'd know people like that. And we did Sweet Thing and it actually charted for a period of time, but I was not Larry Henley. Larry Henley had a totally different falsetto than I did. And I think because they listened to this so hard, they thought I could do that again. The song isn't bad at all, but it's not me, and we weren't the new beats. And it was difficult for me to do what they expected, so they ended up calling the group Snoopy and the Others, I think because of another tune that was out, correct? Royal Guardsmen. Royal Guardsmen, I forgot that. But that was a story about that. It, it, it was fun, didn't last long. I can't picture myself and my life being with the newbies, but it was a compliment. Well, I can't feel sorry for Larry Henley that left the New Beats <laughs> either, because he went on to a very, very successful writing career in country music and in pop music. Probably his biggest success as a writer was Wind Beneath My Wings. That was the Bent Medler song. Then so. the other time, um, which was really, this is an important subject. There was a song called um, I'm Not Going to Work Today by Boot Hog Pefferly and the Loafers. Uh, most everybody knows it that is a, uh, fan of John Harrigan, and uh, it was one of the most fun recordings, I think, that any musician in the room had ever been on. We were in a studio that was not much bigger than this room. I'm embellishing a bit, but there were no baffles between the drums and the lead singer. In fact, I, I jotted down a few of the names of the bands and the people that performed on it, may I? Sure. Uh, the Silvertones, the Monarchs, the Trendells, the Sultans, the Counts, and the Carnation were all of the bands that were represented by the attendees and performers. 
and they were um, Johnny Harrigan, which I have to say, at the time the song was being produced by Ray and Hardy because they thought it was a good follow-up to Gary U.S. Bond's big, big, big hit, New Orleans. And you slap back echo, small room, a lot of horns, and this team of musicians were just that. Harrigan just nailed the, the lead, Bill Mathley, and Jerry, so, or Jimmy Sevels, of course, Judy Woods, George Fallbush was on guitar, Dusty Miller, Tommy Jolly, Eddie Humphreys, Leon, and John Campbell. So it was a room just mobbed with talent. I say that with a sincere compliment because we only did one or two, maybe three takes, and the magic came together of the band, and that one charted. I don't remember how it charted, but it was out about the same time Look Homeward Angel was. Yes, at the same time Look Homeward Angel was number one on Wacky and WKLO, I'm Not Going to Work was either number three or number four on the local charts. Some of the same musicians were on right, both were on sessions. both sessions, which to my knowledge was a once in a lifetime happening for those people to be on the local charts twice, which uh, I'm not going to work also charted on Billboard's mm -hmm. Bubbling Under chart. Didn't quite make the top 100, but it is on the Bubbling Under charts. It, it was like our record in that it burst to the top on some charts in some communities, but it didn't all happen at the same time. I just can't tell you how much fun it was in that studio that night because of the fact that we're very, 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 very used to being in big studios. Name studios, reputation studios. I have no idea where this is. There's got to be somebody on the band that probably remembers it. Dusty's usually the person that does that. But it was a magic, magic, magic session. So through the years, the Monarchs have been fortunate to seem to have mu magic that followed their music. Can you give any explanation or stories about that? Magic that follows. Um, you know, the first image that comes to my mind is when we were a nine-member group and we would do rehearsals in my mother's home's basement. And all nine of us had to learn a song. And it was awful always when we would start because your interpretation of it or my interpretation of it would be different than what you recorded. So the first time that I guess I ever recalled magic is the first time that Louie, Jimmy, Bobby, and I harmonically nailed it. And it was a kinship that just did create some magic, which then brought in the band's contribution to it, which was absolutely important because if we didn't have equivalent and equal contribution to it, there was no magic. I guess the other magic you're talking about is um, how blessed we were with fans that liked the way we did songs. Our job was not to attempt to copy it, but to interpret it. I think Louie and Dusty call it something different now, monarchize it, is that correct? Yes. Um, but that was a magic part of it also, that no matter what tune we did, we were given compliments by people that were appreciative of what we did. So it was a feedback situation that we used to refer to, or my mother used to refer to as instant gratification. So maybe that was part of the magic, but we enjoyed it for year after year. You said something earlier when we were visiting that nobody in that band ever expected it to last forever, but it has. I think that's a good point to bring up. Even though I quit at 20, they're still going at 60. To me, it was interesting that in the late 60s, when the sound was changing, 
when the British invasion was at its height and the monarchs were having problems getting on the charts. We that had uh, one contractual tune that we had to complete for our contract with Monument South State 7. And it was the last charted record that we had, and it was Climb Every Mountain. Now, Climb Up Every Mountain is as close to a British influenced tune <laughs> as A is to Z. And yet, that was still who we thought we were, and it was an intended follow up to Look Home and Angel, so it was the same, same style. But when you think about it, the music had changed completely dramatically. Groups like the Four Seasons, groups like the Beach Boys, everybody had to change and take a breath. But then along came 1972 and the release of the movie American Graffiti. This was a game changer. Do you remember the first time you saw it? Oh yes. I do too. It was in a drive-in, I think. But all I remember is that well, that movie was made for me or at least me and everybody else that thought like me, which you do, and everybody in the band did. I remember all of us going to see this. It did change everything. And then there was some other ones. Um, you remember uh, Peggy Sue Got Married? Yes. Uh, Buddy Holly story. There were four or five that came out because this one was so successful. And then the radio stations began to refer themselves as oldies. And they began to play the music that was 10 or 15 or 20 years behind us. And the TV shows, Happy, Happy Days, Days. Yeah. and on and on, Laverne and Shirley. Uh, there, there was just something about that time period that people loved to reminisce about. Well, it was about the time that we decided that we should quit because we didn't really have anything else to offer. But because of what we're talking about, it was absolutely required that we continue to do it. And I think that's what's kept the glue together all these years is the, is the fact that the music's still like. I don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 years. I mean, the oldies that my uh, offspring listen to aren't the same music that we listen to. So what does this 60th anniversary mean to you personally? It's a fraternity. It's a kinship of the musical community that exists in this community we live in. And it starts with me with the Monarchs. Even though I've been out of the Monarchs for more years than I was in the Monarchs, I still consider myself being a Monarch. When I do get a chance to do a um, guest appearance, it's as if there's been no loss in years we uh, have the same magic that happens on stage that we did when I was sharing with you the rehearsal. I'm just glad to be a part of a community that represents the music I grew up with. There must be a hundred bands in this town that I remember. We don't listen. By the way, I want to say something to you and Brenda to interrupt myself. Part of the glue that held everybody together is the Bible, I refer to it, that you and your wife put together called Louisville's Own, where everybody was mentioned. And if you didn't, if you weren't mentioned into it, you didn't exist. We did, and by the way, thank you for all of us for what you did. But that's, that's my story, being part of the music and never not being part of the music. Ooh.